this is Pastor Teresa Barrington at the First Christian Church in Windsor, Colorado. Today, my message is titled, Ten Talents. Now, in the days of Jesus, it was really common that if a person wasn't able to be a business owner, uh, to run their own business, then they would be uh, either work for or actually be the servant of someone who could do that. Now, a servant didn't usually receive any money, but they did get uh, lodging and food and you know some of the basic needs taken care of, and maybe sometimes they did get some funds. But these days, uh, we're not we don't we're not used to that concept of servants. We still do have businesses, and those who you know work for another business owner are more considered to be employees or contractors. Now, instead of getting paid room and board, we get paid money, right? So we take our money and uh, we buy the things that we need, or maybe we the things that we want. Maybe we don't necessarily need them, but we use our money for that. Now, in contrast to all of that, so we have the, the servanthood of, of Jesus' time, we have employment of this time. What about the kingdom of God? What's the... Uh, What's the arrangement there? Well, in the kingdom of God, uh, we put uh, uh, basically uh, love <laughs> is the currency of the kingdom of heaven. And so as we're usually we're careful about building up our savings account. I wonder if we're careful about uh, also saving up our spiritual wealth. Remember the scripture says where your heart is there, your treasure will be also. So where is your treasure today? Now, one of the things that children will learn uh, when they go to school is that uh, they're going to get a test. They're going to be tested. There's going to be quizzes. And uh, what that testing is all about is for them to, uh, the teachers to gauge how much the children have been learning. So if they fail the test, then the teacher is going to wonder, well, why wasn't this child prepared to take this test? If they pass it or even they get a perfect score, then that also is evidence of that they made an effort, that they did the work, uh, and maybe even did it excellently. So and it shall be like that when we, for us too, when we get to the end of our allotted days, an evaluation is going to be made of the effort we have extended toward the kingdom of God. Now, how do I know this is true? Well, in Matthew chapter 25, I want you to turn there with me now. In Matthew 25, Jesus is delivering a set of parables to the people who are listening to him. And he's talking about what the kingdom of heaven is like. Uh, he's basically drawing a contrast, too. He's drawing something uh, of the earth that we will understand, but it has a spiritual context. So if you'll turn with me to Matthew, the 25th chapter, what you're going to see right there, the top of it says the parable of the ten virgins. I've already preached on that uh, before, but the basic story is that there were ten virgins. Five of them had their lamps all full. They're getting ready for a wedding. It must be something they used to do, right, for the weddings. And, uh, but five of them were not prepared. They did not have oil in their lamp. And so then the bridegroom came. And five went in and five didn't make it to the wedding. He said that's what the kingdom of heaven is like. And then he talks about another parable. And this is the parable of the talents. Will you turn with me there? Matthew 25, verse 14. And here's what it says. Just the first verse there, chapter, four, or chapter 25, verse 14. He says, again... So another example, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them, or some other translations will say his goods. He, he just delivered them <laughs> to them, his goods. So in this parable, Jesus is the man, okay? Jesus is the man, and he's traveled from earth back to heaven, a very far country, right? And we're the ones who are chosen and who have chosen to be his servants. He calls us each to him. And what uh, he does then is he gives us his goods. So what do the goods of the master 
represent to us? What is the wealth of Christ? Is it the world's money? Well, sometimes. Sometimes God does, uh, Christians can have money. There's nothing wrong with having money. They can be uh, gifted with that. But really what it is, uh, the goods of Jesus is the love of God and, and his forgiveness and his grace and his mercy and, and his salvation and certainly all the truths that Jesus taught and what are contained in the scriptures. Those are the goods that Jesus is giving to us as his servants. Now, some of times, uh, this can also be gifts, true gifts and talents. Talents are things that you're just good at, uh, easy to do. You have skills, right? Those can be also from the Lord. Now, here's the question. Does Jesus, when he gives us his goods, does he give the same to everybody? No, he gives different things to different people. So it's not really an equal thing. Uh, some people get more than others. And this is true in the scripture as well. Um, read uh, verse 15 with me. To one of his servants, to one he gave five talents of money, to another he gave two talents, and to another he gave one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. So do you know what a talent is? Do you know what this is talking about, a talent? Well, we don't either, really, from what I can tell. Um, other than we know from this scripture that it was probably a very large sum of money. Some translations will say it was a bag of gold, which in their time would be like a million dollars in our time. So here Jesus gave this one guy $5 million and another guy $2 million and one guy $1 million. Think of it that way as we work our way through this scripture. So um, you have a, a million dollars. So the man did not give each person equally, but according to his ability. So the master knew, he knew what each person was capable of. Uh, he didn't want to give them too much or would overwhelm them or maybe they'd waste it. And I'll tell you what, God does not like uh, his resources to be wasted uh, ever. Um, so Jesus does the same with us. He knows how much we can handle. That's great, right? That's great that he gives us. He might give us some talents or skills or abilities. He might even give us uh, money and wealth. Uh, some people can only deal with one talent, only one gifting. Uh, to some people, God gives two talents. And to some, he gives uh, much more. Have you ever met a five-talent person? I mean, that person, they can sing like an angel and dance like David and I mean just everything they touch seems to turn to gold a person like that because they're basically good at everything that they do have you ever uh, compared yourself to that kind of a person well I'll tell you what don't do it comparison is not what God wants for us it's actually uh, I've called it a, a, a form of self-hate uh, to do that. It, it never yields a good result. In fact, if you compare yourself to someone and you judge yourself as lacking, then you're devaluing the gift or gifts that God gave you. Uh, if you compare yourself and think you're better, then that's prideful and, and not a good idea either because you're taking credit for what God did, right? God was the one that gave it to you. You didn't give it to yourself. And so that's not a good thing. So if you, um, um, you have talents, you have things that God has given to you. Uh, what are those things? Now, there's a commentary by a, a man, his last name is Bengal, and he said, really, these talents are spiritual gifts, temporal resources, so that means things of the earth, resources, time itself. Did you ever think that time is a gift? Do you know that there's people, their bodies already in the grave are turned to dust? that didn't get to live as long as you. And finally, opportunities of every kind. So your talent could be a lot of different things that God has given you. So what are you supposed to be doing with your time, your money, your resources, and your opportunities? Now, in this parable, the master didn't tell him what to do with this money, did he? He didn't say, oh, go invest it in this mutual fund and go do that over to the, you know, the cobbler. No, he just 
basically left and uh, left them to their own. Um, so he distributed, so you leave. So that what did each servant choose to do? Let's look. Verse uh, 16 and 17. So what happened? The man who had received the five talents went at once. He didn't wait. He didn't wait a single minute. He went at once and put his money to work and he gained five more talents. So also the one with two talents, he gained two more. Well, that's good, right? They went out, they, they, did, they did better, right? They, they doubled their money. So they, how did they know? Like, how to do that? How did they know? Because they've been watching their master. They knew what their master expected. They did. Um, and, and the thing is that they knew it wasn't their money. The master didn't say, uh, just here's my money, go do with it what you like, right? Um, it says right from the beginning, those, that, that stuff belonged to that man. So they just followed his example. That's what they did. And you know what? It didn't matter if the master was watching over them or not. Uh, they did what was right in the eyes uh, of their Lord. And so it is with us, is it not? God has given you talents of time and money and resources and opportunities and what are you doing with them? I mean, I've been asking myself these same questions. I mean, I'm always continually uh, scanning myself to see what am I doing? What am I doing with what God has given me? Are you treating these resources and time and money as if it's yours? Uh, well, I'll tell you, it's not. <laughs> Everything that's yours belongs to God. Everything he's given you is his, right? Um, so don't be like the, the man. There's, a, there's another parable. Uh, that Jesus told. And this guy, he had his barns full of grain, and he, would, he had a great harvest, and he was so glad. And instead of giving his abundance away, he said, I'm just going to build me some new barns. I want you to read that, and let's see what happened to him. That's in uh, the book of Luke. So let's turn just a few chapter two, a couple books forward to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, and we're going to start in the 16th chapter. This is the parable of the rich fool. Here's what it says, uh, Jesus, and he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? What shall I do? I have a good crop. Uh, I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, hmm, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and, and, and I'll build bigger ones. And there, I'll store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for, for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? And Jesus gave this admonition. He said, this is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich toward God. That's something to think about. Are you building barns? Are you investing in your own things or the things of God? Now, if we go back to, to Matthew again, here Jesus is talking to us. He's saying, um, I'm away but I still want you to emulate me. I still want you to do what I would do if I was given your talents and gifts. What would Jesus do with your talents, with your talents and gifts? That's such a huge question, don't you think? That's such a huge question. What would Jesus do with my gifts? Even if it's just one, what would he do with it? Well, I'll tell you one thing. He wouldn't have done what the third guy did. Look at verse uh, 18 in uh, Matthew 25. So go back over there. Here's what it says. But he who had received one talent, right? He went and dug in the ground and he hid his Lord's money. What? What did he do? He took a million dollars and dug a hole in his backyard and put it down in there. Oh, come on. That's kind of crazy. Uh, I'll tell you what, Jesus didn't hide or cover up a single thing. 
that God had given to him. He worked hard every day of his life to expand the kingdom of God and help people understand it. So this third sermon, uh, he didn't work hard at all. In fact, he didn't work at all, did he? He just stopped. He took the easy route. He, he, while the other servants were probably out talking to people and making deals and buying and selling and getting up early and working hard and staying up late, right? Here's this other guy, the third guy, and he's probably out, you know, probably sleeping in, hanging out with his buddies, doing whatever he pleased because, hey, master's not here. How'd that work out for him? Well, let's see. Verse uh, 19. It says, after a long time, maybe 2,000 plus years, in our case, <laughs> the master of those servants returned and uh, settled accounts with them. Now, some would call this the day of reckoning. And this sentence implies that both the master and the servants knew that this day was coming and that they'd have to show him what, what they did while he was gone and that day had come. So let's read verses 20 through uh, 23. See what happened. So, the man who had received five talents brought another five. Master, he said, you have entrusted me with five talents, and see, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come, and share in your master's happiness. And in the King James, it says, share in the joy of your Lord. I love that. Share in the joy of your Lord. The man with two talents also came. Master, he said, you have entrusted me with two talents. See, I've gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in a few things. I will put you in charge of many. Come and share in your master's happiness. Well, did you notice something about those two guys? Even though they received different, some different amounts of talents, different amounts of money, did they get a different reward? Did the five talent guy get more? No, they got exactly the same reward. So God isn't comparing you to someone that has more talents. He's not. He gave you what he knew you could handle. So you need to be content with that, as I need to be content with the things that God has given me. Your reward is not going to be any less. It's going to be the same. You get the praise of your Lord. You get uh, more authority. You get more freedom, right? Um, and you get to enter into the joy of the Lord. I mean, seriously, what else? I'm not asking for any more than that, personally. I'm not. So let's uh, say, what happened to the lazy hole digger, right? Uh, he was given a gift too, but he didn't do anything with it. Uh, and I'll tell you what, that hole became his grave. Let's read uh, verse 24. It says, the man who had received the one talent came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So... I was afraid, and I went out, and I hid your talent in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. Oh, my goodness. What did his master say? You wicked and lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown, and I gather where I have not scattered seed. Like, you knew that. You're telling me who I am, what I'm like. Well, then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers. So that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. Like, you could have at least done that. All right. Whoa. And, and then it says in verse uh, 29, or 28, it says, So take the talent from him. So now he's given orders. He says, take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. Verse 29 tells us, For everyone who has, uh, who, for everyone who has more will be given and he will have abundance, but from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And, the, and they cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping 
and gnashing of teeth. Let's look uh, at the master's answer. Let's just break it down a little bit because it seems pretty harsh, doesn't it? Uh, at first glance. <laughs> so the third servant, get this, he didn't trick his master. Um, there was a reason he only got one talent to begin with. That's all that his master probably felt like he could uh, handle. Um, and yet uh, the master was really clear about what he expected uh, from him. And so he's saying, I know how you are and I know uh, what I expect, and so do you. So get this, um, this was a revelation I got in reading this, is that uh, there's other verses that say you reap what you sow. So if you're a farmer, you're putting out wheat, you're gonna reap wheat, right? Well, this is saying that um, with God, we as his servants, when we sow, God reaps. Isn't that interesting? So everything that we do, we think it's up to us, it's for us, but God is actually reaping. If you're re reaping weeds and tares, guess what God is going to sow? I mean, not, no, right? Um, that's not. So when we're God's, God's children, that's, what, that's how it works. Everything that we do and everything we have belongs to God, even if we think it was us. So what did the master do? He suggested that the, the servant could have at least put the money in the bank and it could have drawn interest. If you, if you want to be lazy and not increase the gifts that God gave you, at least pray for the people who are working, okay, that are trying to ex expand the kingdom. That's like putting a, a interest on a, a spiritual gift. So at least do that. I mean, that's... That's one thing that you could do. I think there's so many Christians that they don't work for God and they don't even think to pray. And if they do, it's pretty self-serving and self-centered. And I'm not saying that's how everybody is, but it, there's a lot of that going on right now. So the first two servants, they were rewarded with praise and authority and the joy of the Lord. And... Uh, I mean, that, that sounds great to me. They had a lot of freedom, but this third servant, he wasn't rewarded, was he? And, and what did the master decide to do with him? Right? He took away the only talent he had, the only gift. It's like he just took it away and he gave it to the now 10 talent. That, that guy's 11 talents now. And then he cast him out. He was no longer a servant of the master. He lost probably his house, his food, you know? everything and what does his life what's his life going to be like it says he was out in utter darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth regret regret and so the choice to be uh, lazy didn't pay off at all and you know what he was even accusing the master that the reason he was lazy was because of the master of uh, the master no so in closing I want you to look at one more verse this is in Ephesians chapter 2 so this is a letter from from Paul, and this, this verse isn't really often translated this way or uh, talked about this way, but in Ephesians 2, verse 10, it says this, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which had been prepared in advance for us to do. So just listen to that again. For we are God's workmanship. He made us, right? He created us in Christ Jesus for what? To do good works. And what, what good works? The good works that God prepared in advance for us to do. Think about that. Think about that. Let us pray. Dear Lord God, uh, your word tells us that before we were born, you prepared a certain amount of work, a certain kind of work for each one of us to do. Now I know, Father, it's not your way to force us to do that. We have that free will. But Jesus tells us in these parables about the kingdom of, of heaven that, that if we work hard, if we're diligent, and, and we make the most of what you've given to us, we will be rewarded. We can uh, complain all we want and we can make excuses, but... Lord, none of those words are going to fool you on the day when, when you open up those books and everything that we've said or everything that we've done is examined. 
it doesn't take away our, our salvation. Uh, but we want to please you, Lord God. We want you to be pleased with, with what's written in those books. And so I just pray, Lord God, that this parable will stir up in those who are hearing my voice to become diligent workers for the kingdom of God. Help us, Lord God, keep us from being hypocrites where we just walk, walk the walk or talk the talk, but we don't walk the walk, right, God? Um, we want to be diligent in loving all people, Lord God. And I know because of this virus, it's so easy for us to make an excuse. Oh, it's so hard now. I, I can't do anything. I can't, I can't do what I used to do. Well, that's just an excuse. God, you sent us here for this time. We need to be creative on how to multiply even double, triple, quadruple the talents and gifts that you had given us, no matter what the circumstance, no matter what the hardship. Father, forgive us for being lazy. Forgive us for being so invested in this world that our own selfish desires take precedence. And Father, I just, I also ask that you forgive us for being afraid. There's, fear is not of you. Fear is not of God. Purify our hearts and set our feet on the path that leads to righteousness, God. We have to walk in the power of your love. And that's how we're going to meet these challenges that we're facing ahead, Lord God. Dear Jesus, I just pray you're speaking to our hearts right now. I know what you're saying. You're saying, get ready and work extra hard because I am coming back soon. Get ready. It's in your name I pray because you are our one true master. We pray and beg you for help. Amen. Amen. So your assignment's a little bit different um, this week. There's a commentary uh, that I found on our verses for today. It's uh, Henry's concise commentary on Matthew 25, 14 through 20. I'm going to be posting that um, in uh, the uh, comments of Facebook, and I'll put it on the website. I need you to read that. I need you to read it and contemplate it and let it soak into your heart. Uh, not just the words I've said, but especially the words here. And then this will give you a little bit of punch to drive it home for those who of you who are serious about your walk with Christ and what he's calling you to do. So um, please do that this week. I pray God blesses you. I pray that he spurs you on to greater works of love for his kingdom's sake. See you next week.